name's Daniel Williams, Senior Editor of Industry Content at MGMA. Welcome to today's webinar, The Path to Success in Value-Based Care Models, How Better Blood Pressure Measurement Can Improve Lives and Bottom Lines. Thanks again so much, everybody, for joining us. We'd also like to thank Midmark for their sponsorship. You can visit their website at midmark.com, where you can learn more about how to design better care experiences, harmonizing clinical space, workflow, and technology at the point of care. A couple of housekeeping items. Resources can be found in the additional resources window on the left side of your screen. Both the live and on-demand experiences are eligible for ACMPE and CEU credit. Also, for the live experience only, you can claim ACHE, CME, and PDU credit. For anyone claiming CME credit, you will need to answer the question on the left side of your screen. We love interactivity, so please submit your questions using the Ask Question window on your screen. Make sure you use this window for all content questions for presenters and tech questions for MGMA staff. Attendee chat will not be used for the Q&A. For other tools and engagement options, including the attendee chat window and help, please use the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. The session will now begin. In today's webinar, Dr. Thomas Schwederman, Vice President of Clinical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer of Midmark Corporation, and Dr. Ellis Knight, Advocate for Healthcare Improvement We'll discuss how inaccurate point of care blood pressure attainment can lead to improper clinical management and drive poor performance on value-based care payment incentives. Doctors, I know you have a lot of great information to share with us, so I'm gonna turn this over to you now. Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, this is Dr. Tom Sweeterman. We had a little uh, audio video issues that we won't be able to see me on the video, but uh, we'll do our best to make this as engaging as possible with audio only. I'm going to say hi, and then I'll ask uh, Dr. Knight to say hi uh, as well. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mac Knight. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today and uh, look forward to uh, uh, partnering with my Associate Dr. Schwederman and giving you some good information here. Thanks. Thank you, Mac. Um, today's talk is really about this value-based e e uh, care equation that all of us are wrestling with, the, the foot and two canoes, if you will. How are we going to take each of our organizations, move them from the traditional fee-for-service market and into something more value-based, uh, more uh, focused on clinical outcomes at lower cost? And uh, my focus is really going to be on the clinical side of blood pressure attainment as part of that value-based equation. We're talking about why this is such a critical, actually foundational element to your success in value-based care. Then I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Knight, who is an expert in the value-based care market scenario and kind of uh, bring it home from a uh, financial perspective as to how this relates to your underlying performance of your own institution. Uh, to, the takeaways for today are really to talk about blood pressure as, as sort of that element that you have to get right. It's uh, usually an analogy tied uh, several conversations where if you can't make a three-foot putt as a pro professional golfer, the rest of the game is going to get really tough for you. So blood pressure is sort of that three-foot putt that all of us need to know how to do effectively because it leads to so many other um, either positive or negative consequences within your own practice. So we're looking at how these errors uh, come into the blood pressure attainment process, and we're going to talk a little bit what the manifestation of in errors are on a clinical perspective, uh, what that does to your practice dynamic uh, from a care management standpoint. And then, as I said earlier, Dr. Knight's going to kind of bring home some of the financial aspects of it. We're not going to leave you with a sort of a identifying a problem without giving you some solutions. So we're going to end the conversation with a, uh, the best practices that you can all employ, you know, with very short order, with relatively low, uh, you know, training or investment that could make a real impact on your own uh, uh, clinical work domain you're in. But let's start with a poll question. 
So today's uh, poll question is going to be this. And uh, I don't know if you guys can see the question. Is it, I see the answers, but uh, there. I have my, my trusty assistant coming on. Okay, when taking a blood pressure measurement at the point of care, which of the following do you feel is true? So you have uh, five answers there on the left. So I'll give you a little bit of time to help us with that uh, assessment to see where you are because it helps guide our conversation to tailor to uh, kind of where your understanding is. So I'll give it a few minutes here. It's not Okay, starting to see the uh, votes come in. About five or ten more seconds here. Okay, so we'll just go into this. And an answer that most of you picked is the resting VP is significantly impacted by improper protocol and it's now essential. In fact, uh, that's good. Uh, we're going to reaffirm much of that. I think I sort of led the led the audience to this conclusion early on, which is good. Uh, but I also see some individuals, about 20%, that don't quite know that impact, which is uh, a good thing because you're in exactly the right webinar to talk about that very, uh, that very question. So let's talk about vital signs in general. I think this has been labeled a vital sign for a very specific reason and that it assesses the patient's current condition in a very fundamental way. Uh, we all know the vital signs of temperature, pulse, rate, height, weight. We're now seeing pulse ox as considered a vital sign, but I, I, I really identifying blood pressure as the most important uh, vital sign is, has got merit behind it. And I'll tell you throughout this, org this webinar that in my clinical practice career, which now spans you know, 30 plus years, this element of care management just gets stronger and stronger and more impactful to how successful you can be with a population or an individual patient. So we're going to talk a little bit about why we feel that blood pressure is probably the most important vital sign and something that you should be paying very careful attention to, but why? Well, it's absolutely essential to effective care management. Um, if you have a patient who's coming in who's unstable, the first thing a doctor wants to know is what's the blood pressure because that's the life-sustaining uh, scenario that you have to be most uh, uh, you know, attentive to, but really that's an unusual circumstance. The more common circumstance is that when someone comes in with a blood pressure assessment, you have a pretty good identification of what their overall health picture looks like. Uh, blood pressure relates to your endocrine system, your vascular system, your neurologic system, and it really does point in all different directions to kind of give you a quick assessment as to where that patient's uh, current risk state uh, exists and where the long-term state exists. Uh, over the course of my career, I've seen many, many more chronic conditions come into play as being directly attributed to a blood pressure as a risk factor. When I started, it was really just the cardiovascular conditions, the uh, heart attacks and strokes, and um, in some cases, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, over the course of the career, it's become much more clear that other things have uh, manifestations of blood pressure. We'll talk about that, including cognitive disorders. There's a few cancers that are related to blood pressure as a risk factor. And as we enter value-based care, those are your big ticket items, the things that really can impact or make or break on your profit, uh, profitability as an organization. Um, it's also increasingly been shown that with effective management, you can reduce the overall morbidity and mortality of the patient population. This is not even, uh, 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 well, I shouldn't say not even, this is something that has became very evident as a sprint trial came out in 2017, which is also something we'll quickly touch on you know, later in this webinar. And you can really make an impact on your long-term care expense profile and your population health metrics by just paying attention to this single component of your patient profile. Um, it's extremely costly as its own entity. Um, the hypertension uh, cost uh, estimates that are out there that a patient with high blood pressure costs the system approximately $2,500 annually uh, for just managing that patient, whether that's office visits, whether it's labs, whether it's medications, and it's other, other things that are associated with uh, managing that patient effectively. There are 650 million prescriptions each year. 
Uh, and all this, if you take all accounts, all attributable costs and the size of the population, we're talking billions of dollars. Uh, it's this number, the $29 billion, is probably already outdated with the inflationary pressures we're all experiencing as well as uh, the aging of the population. I would imagine this number is probably into the 30s at least. And uh, the total associated costs with people coming out of work, uh, missing uh, time uh, at, uh, at their employer at life, we're talking close to $80 billion. So this is in the big leagues, if you will, of uh, what of an area that the U.S. health system has to pay attention to. And we're going to you know, say that this is actually getting even a little more impactful over the last uh, five to six years as we've begun to study hypertension at a deeper level, what we're identifying is the lower numbers are becoming more apparently risky for the long-term outcome, negative outcomes, as we thought the higher numbers were. If you look at the lifetime risk, we're looking at a population today that's just about 45% uh, considered to be hypertensive, which means you know about half the U.S. population has a uh, ICD-9 code directly attributed to blood pressure, which is astounding. So as you're managing your offices in your clinic, about every other patient walking in the door currently has blood pressure. What's really stark about that number is it's not a matter of if a patient's going to have blood pressure, but more so a matter of when. If you look at the lifetime incidence of, of hypertensive disorders, men in particular, as high as 90% of all individuals, what at some point uh, become hypertensive and require some sort of intervention, which which takes us to kind of the, the, the situation at hand. You're doing this measure every single patient, every single day in your clinic, and it becomes a real challenge as a doc as the when is enough is enough where a patient's creeping up in a linear fashion year over year. At what point do you need to therapy, therapeutically intervene you know, beyond lifestyle with a pharmaceutical agent? So... In that circumstance, trusting the data that you're being uh, given is really, really important because trending is really the, the, the mainstay of good, effective management. So if you tr trust the data that's coming to you as a clinician, you can trust the moment of truth when you really have to intervene with that patient versus what's often happening today where, well, I just had a cup of coffee, doc, or, hey, I'm nervous because you know, X, Y, Z is occurring in my life or you name it. A lot of times those patients that do need therapy are getting um, avoiding therapy, both on the farm, uh, prescriber side, but also on the patient side because the data is not particularly trustworthy. We don't have that great, you know, threshold event where you, you know, you got to start intervening. This is the, this is where the game changed for me as a, as a clinician uh, with respect to, to blood pressure. Uh, there are sentinel events in, in, the, in the clinical life of a physician where suddenly everything changes. Um, and you can look back on, like, hormone replacement therapy. That was an episode of where things changed uh, and reverted back again. You talk about weight loss medications, another example. Uh, you talk about new therapies, you interventions of MRI and things that change your ability to diagnose. The SPRINT trial was that for blood pressure. In 2017, uh, the, a group of clinicians completed a study that was eventually published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the preeminent pinnacle of clinical science. And they identified a very interesting finding, and that is by lowering the blood pressure to a threshold that's 10 points, and in some cases 20 points lower than what was considered normal previously, that being 140 over 90, and dropping it down to 130 over 80, there was a 26% reduction in long-term uh, ill effects of blood pressure uh, uh, illness, i.e. Uh, MIs, heart attacks, strokes, peripheral vascular disease. The numbers were so dramatic that the cascade that occurred following the SPRINT trial was, was something that you don't often see in medicine, where uh, whole uh, uh, specialty groups, including American Heart Association, the American Academy of Cardiology, and go down the line, all became very aware that the treatment of blood pressure in this country has been treating to the wrong goal. What else was really interesting in this study is that prior to this study, the taking of a blood pressure was considered a somewhat of a routine accepted practice, and the number's a number. 
The Sprint study group found out that this was absolutely not the case, that they had to very carefully define how the blood pressure was taken. And the Sprint group, for the first time that I know of, put all the pieces together for the best pro protocol for blood pressure attainment going into the study. And their argument was good, is that if we're going to advise lower threshold for treatment, we got to trust the data that we're getting to see that we're actually getting the right type of clinical picture of these patients. So they describe things like uh, averaging blood pressure over three readings after a rest period, uh, properly positioning the patient so that they're in a comfortable position, arm supported, and we'll talk about some of those features as well. And what, what this did was it sort of opened the door to say that blood pressure is, is, is not just the six-inch putt that a lot of doctors looked at it upon. It's becoming more that wary five, six-foot putt where you really got to think about you know, how you're going to approach it. And, and so with the sprint trial, the how in blood pressure measurement became in, increasingly important. The other attribute that the sprint trial did is that sort of normalized therapeutic uh, testing of blood pressure to the automated systems. Uh, they did the analysis on whether a manual reading or, or an automated system is, is preferred. And on a population sense, I'll emphasize the word population sense, across a system, which many of you are managing yourself, it, it was shown to them that an automated system is preferred because it reduces the uh, avoidable errors of human dynamics. It takes about a minute, a minute and a half to get a blood pressure done effectively uh, if you're doing it correctly with a slow descent of the mercury, and most people don't do that. So the sprint trial really changed our perspective on the how. What it also showed is that impact of treatment is kind of what we hoped, uh, that if you do a good job affecting blood pressure management, the rewards are rich and the rewards are, are fairly broad spectrum. And one thing that I find quite fascinating, in addition to the clear, you know, obvious ones of heart disease and strokes and, and, and peripheral vascular disease, which we all have already in our heads as a relationship to blood pressure was the cognitive disorders. They found secondary analytics of the data set of these tens of thousands of patients found a dramatic reduction in the 20 plus percent range of Alzheimer's type dementias of cognitive problems. And if you think about that, this is the first avoidable risk factor for cognitive disorders uh, from a uh, physiologic sense that we have uh, identified. that uh, Most of the time prior to this, including in my practice, I'd say, well, do your best to you know, stay active and eat healthy and do the best you can, you know, because your mother had Alzheimer's or dementias. Now we have something we can go after and treat to help that individual really avoid it in a, in a real material sense. Uh, the problem we see is that chart on the left. Um, despite these clear relatively low cost interventions and you know, I can tell you that most of the blood pressure medicines that I would prescribe and are continuously prescribed are generic in nature you know the four dollar Walmart monthly prescription variety only half or less than half of the US population is being treated to the right levels which is creating this sort of uh, kind of sense of urgency that you know we have a chronic disease disaster in the US from a cost perspective and we have something that could mitigate those costs in a fairly remarkably substantial way, and we're not doing a real good job of doing it. So let's talk a little bit about capturing and this call to action. I told you when the sprint trial came out, everybody, a lot of years perked up. Uh, the AMA perked up, the American Heart Association perked up, the American College of Cardiology perked up, and they all began to realize that uh, this is time to do something as simple as a blood pressure and blood pressure management better. And one thing that came out uh, in 2020 was the Surgeon General of the United States uh, put out a call to action report. You can download this. It's a, it's a free download. It's part of our federal government. And uh, every year or so, every other year perhaps, the federal government, the uh, Surgeon General, will put out a call to action on a particular illness or issue that, uh, that comes along. You'll remember C. Everett Coop on smoking. Uh, this one was about a call to action to taking to getting blood pressure under better control because, as most of us know, 47 plus percent of our United States healthcare dollars come from the federal uh, from the governmental variety. And the first thing they pointed out in this call to action, was, was one that I've highlighted on top, is the accurate blood pressure attainment. When you take 
the U.S. population to shift the blood pressure guidelines down 10 points, and you approach half of the U.S. population being considered hypertensive, it becomes really, really important that you, you have a clear assessment of what, what's, pre, what's half you're in. And uh, when five points of mercury differentiate normal to abnormal, you know, accuracy becomes a therapeutic uh, decision mandate. And as the aging population occurs, unfortunately, I think those statistics are going to uh, hit the majority category of people with blood pressure disorders. Another thing that happened uh, since then is the United States Preventative Task Force. The United States Preventative Task Force is a as an institution in the U.S. that has just ex exploded here in the last five to ten years. And what this group does is they look at all of the chronic condition management needs, requirements, and they also look at the preventative measures, and they look at all the evidence behind whether it's warranted or not warranted. So there's a group that will say you need colonoscopy starting at age 40 or 50. They're the ones that say mammograms are at this age, and they provide deep, deep scientifics and statistical analysis to say this is worthwhile because it has a cost-benefit uh, uh, to it. And you may have just heard they came out with the vitamin assessment from the USPSTS saying that vitamin supplements you know, are of modest uh, uh, benefit to humans as far as uh, preventive disorders. Well, they looked at blood pressure, too, and they looked at the, important, the, the way blood pressure is being measured because they recognize that the data in, data out problem of, of, of managing a patient, if you don't have good data in, it's hard to get good management out. So they looked at a whole host of studies, 50-plus uh, studies, led by a, a seasoned uh, researcher from uh, Stanford in California. And what they determined is that there's a lot to be desired on office-based measurement uh, or any measurement of blood pressure. But despite all the, the issues going on in the marketplace, blood pressure attainment at the point of care at the physician's office remains uh, the point of diagnosis, that this measuring technique and capability of doing it properly you know, outweighs the uh, white coat scenarios and outweighs the convenience of at-home measurement, that we, st we still should be seeing the clinician's office as the point of diagnostic uh, decision-making. But they, they followed it up with a keenly stated uh, major accuracy limitation uh, kind of clause in there. And they pointed out that most of the tests that they and studies that they reviewed uh, did not do a good job of effectively positioning patients properly or doing the right techniques of blood pressure, that they were the older variety where we just got a number and tried to do a relationship of that number to some clinical concern. They, they started to say that in the study, this review article, that there is severe issues with the studies being done and there needs to be more, you know, more analysis done. So the point making with all this isn't to get esoteric in clinical science. It's basically saying, hey, we have a blood pressure problem in the U.S. Hey, the numbers are important. Hey, the outcomes are significant if you improve it. But, boy, we need to do a better job at the point of care measuring it because that is of high, high concern. So let's talk about a little bit of that just to give you a, you know, all of us want to know, okay, I hear you, but how much? How, how impactful is it? Is it a couple points? Is it three points? Does it matter that much? Do I have time to do all these things? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about what the improper methods, what the consequences are. So what we did is we took this study uh, from the United States Preventive Task Force and went into the bibliography and went into some of the data tables and pulled out the um, accuracy impacts of each of the uh, known issues that occur, you know, in a traditional practice. Now, you all are in practices, so patients coming in holding a Starbucks in their hand, smoking in the lobby or outside before they walk in the door is a common scenario. But those patients who are walking in, under that circumstance, we'll have a five to twenty, po five to, you know, up to twenty points difference in their blood pressure. So it's an indication that you're not getting a true resting BP. You may be getting a normal life BP, but you're not getting the resting BP, which is where all the therapeutic decisions are apt to be made. You see the dramatic effect of white coat hypertension, where the, sheer, the mere presence of another clinician in the room, you know, stimulates the adrenal glands and the blood pressure typically goes up. And you can see the other errors there, like uh, 
unsupported back or the uh, feet are crossed, the feet aren't on the floor, you're talking. If you will see the darker line, the vertical gray line that goes to zero, that is what the blood pressure should be. That's the authenticated resting BP. And what you'll see with these errors is, by and large, on average, they are significantly high. And, and Dr. Mac uh, Knight will talk to you a little bit later. If you're getting artificially high interventions, uh, I'm sorry, blood pressure measurements, you're going to get artificially significant interventions. You're going to be putting on more medications. You're going to be seeing more often in your office. And just as importantly, the metrics you submit to your quality assessment uh, teams and your payers are probably going to be 5, 10, 20 points higher too. So this is sort of a giving your patient something they don't want, which is a therapeutic or intervention, and giving something you don't want, which is a, a negative impact on your uh, overall financial possible gains. So this is the, the so what portion of this. Um, 10 points of mercury, and Dr. and I can speak to you on that. Uh, if you have 10 points of uh, difference instead of a 129 over 79, that's 139 over 89, I'm going to treat the one the second case and not the first case, which is a very reasonable potential error uh, based on how blood pressure is done at the point of care today. So I'm going to finish up here with a couple slides um, about at-home measurement or a single slide about at-home measurement. There is an absolute undeniable clinical benefit to at-home measurement. So we're not suggesting at all that there's a, there's a deficit in at-home measurement need. We need more at-home measurements. In fact, uh, what I was surprising, if you were to read that United States Preventer Task Force study, what you'll find is there's a significant population of patients that have normal blood pressure in the office and abnormally high at home, which, which kind of opened my eyes a bit. And those are the people you'll catch with at home. And secondarily, it's often very, very efficient for a patient to be schooled up on proper technique to allow you to sort of adjust the medications from an at-home reading and free up your office for somebody that uh, requires your services more, more urgently and more significantly. So I hope, I hope this early part of the uh, uh, conversation has kind of uh, given me a little perspective of, of blood pressure and its, its, its foundational component to your clinical care of, of all the chronic diseases for the most part of many of them. And I, I want to now kind of turn it over to, to Dr. Knight to kind of talk a little bit about the so what on the financial side that does this extra time and effort and commitment to looking at blood pressure is that going to drive the numbers at the end of the day and uh, help you succeed as an institution so i'm you know, happy to pass it on to uh, dr knight and you can i'll pick it back up when we talk at the very end so thank you thank you tom i appreciate it very much and i'm like i said earlier very glad to be with you this afternoon just a little quick uh, bit about myself. I'm a primary care internist by training. By that I mean I've done primary care on the outpatient basis as an internist early in my career and then shifted into hospital medicine practice, which I did for about the last half of my career. Uh, during that time, I became very interested in the business side of healthcare, and particularly the healthcare economy, which uh, I believe is uh, <clears throat> really the background uh, driver of a lot of things that uh, we are seeing in the exam room and at the bedside with patient care delivery in this day and age. So what do I mean by that? Well, in my professional lifetime, and I'm sure most of you that are listening here, the primary focus, the primary method of uh, economic exchange within the healthcare economy has been through fee-for-service payments. Fee-for-service payments and reimbursements focus on volume. Uh, the more you do, the more you get paid. Uh, they focus particularly on highly reimbursed specialty services. As a primary care provider, I can tell you that, uh, again, there's a lot of discrepancy between what primary care uh, is reimbursed as uh, uh, versus specialty care. Uh, 
economic uh, the the economic effect of the fee for service reimbursement system really causes, in my estimation, a very provider centric focus as opposed to a more patient centered focus. Uh, it's driven costs in the healthcare economy uh, to uh, untenable levels. The uh, cost estimate now is that in this country, about 20% of GDP goes to healthcare. And again, especially as we perhaps enter a, a recessionary period in the overall economy, that may not be uh, sustainable. And then again, it uh, focuses on profit, the fee-for-service reimbursement system does, and commercial insurers, large health systems, physicians, and providers of all sorts, uh, again, tend to focus on the profit margin as opposed to uh, patient care and the value that they're really giving to the patients that they serve. But then that raises the question, well, if, uh, if volume-based delivery fee-for-service payment is not the answer and value-based healthcare delivery is, what is value? What are we really talking about uh, when we say value-based uh, healthcare delivery? And I like to look at it very simply. If you don't come, across, come away from this uh, webinar today uh, with any other knowledge in your head, uh, please remember, I think, the most important thing, and that is that value, in my mind, equals quality per unit of cost. And in healthcare, I think that's extremely important because uh, in healthcare, there's a interesting dynamic whereby quality and cost don't necessarily uh, correlate and go up together. A lot of times, if we can improve quality of care, uh, as Tom mentioned earlier with regard to blood pressure for in management, for instance, we can drive costs down. So quality goes up costs go down and value goes up, and that's the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate goal in a value-based uh, healthcare delivery system. So do we deliver health, do we deliver value in the U.S. healthcare system? Well, here's some data from the Commonwealth Fund, and uh, as you can see here, the U.S. tends to lag way behind other economically developed countries as it relates to the value that we are providing. In other words, higher quality as measured by uh, basic outcomes. We're not talking about real esoteric uh, outcomes here. We're talking about basic things such as life expectancy, such as childhood mortality, and then costs. And as you can see, uh, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, at outcomes on the uh, y-axis and cost on the x-axis, we are way, way, way uh, ahead of most other countries in terms of per capita costs. And we're way down the list and, and way behind our uh, uh, comparable countries in terms of uh, outcomes. So lots of work to do in this country with regards to uh, delivering value and delivering on that value equation I just showed you. So it's important that you within your healthcare organization, whether that's a group practice, whether that's a hospital uh, employed uh, group, whether that's uh, a uh, totally independent practice that you look at where are you on this fee for service versus fee for value life cycle. Uh, I believe that the sigmoid curve is a, a very uh, powerful way of looking at uh, the progression of uh, business activity in any 
industry, but especially in healthcare industry, I think you can get a lot of information by looking at that sigmoid curve where you start up, uh, you begin to, to uh, perhaps even decline a little bit in terms of growth, and then you reach that exponential phase of the curve where uh, you really uh, grow fast. And then you get to a maturity level where perhaps things slow down, begin to plateau off, and then uh, over further time, you may see a decline. And what I think we are at now in most organizations, and we may not even realize this, but take a look at your contracts, take a look at your reimbursement uh, agreements, uh, and I think most of you will see that we're somewhere in this uh, maturity area where we're beginning to maximize uh, the reimbursements that we get from a fee-for-service basis, and we're beginning to move slowly towards this fee-for-value basis. And uh, most of us are, are, are really struggling with how do we make that leap. So what are some of these value-based reimbursement models that you might actually be involved in already uh, and uh, may not even realize it? Well, a lot of payers are paying uh, quality bonuses on top of their usual fee-for-service uh, uh, payments. A lot of uh, payers uh, have shared savings programs. Certainly, I think most of you are aware of Medicare shared savings program, which also goes by uh, the term uh, accountable care organizations or Medicare accountable care organizations. Some of you, especially on the procedural side, may be uh, receiving bundled payments for your care. And again, those are certainly a value-based reimbursement model because uh, most bundled payments uh, only pay for those uh, components of the bundle that are felt to uh, contribute to good outcomes and higher quality and lower costs. And then there's... Uh, uh, models such as uh, Medicare Advantage plans, which pay on a per capita basis uh, over the lifetime of either a, uh, uh, a health care delivery around a certain disease entity or a health care delivery to a population. And uh, certainly those are value-based and uh, also, I might say, risk-adjusted so that uh, the playing field's a little bit more uh, level. So take a look at your agreements, take a look at the way you're getting reimbursed, uh, and I think you'll find that already most of us are in value-based reimbursement models, even though we may not uh, realize that and uh, realize how far we've progressed along that sigmoid curve. CMS seems to be leading the way in this, in, in this regard. I mentioned earlier that uh, you've got the Medicare uh, uh, ACO model. You've got bundled payments through the BPCI program from CP CMS. And then you've got Medicare Advantage, which uh, is shown on this graph to be growing at a very, very fast rate. And uh, I don't know how many listening to this program are involved with Medicare Advantage programs, but it's one of the fastest growing programs in the country. And again, if I had to uh, predict, would become uh, uh, the really the dominant fee-for-service, or excuse me, fee-for-value model that we're going to be seeing uh, on down the road here. So how does all this relate to blood pressure management. Let's bring it down again to uh, from this real high level look to uh, the bedside, to the exam room. And uh, what what is the importance of uh, looking at blood pressure? Well, as Tom mentioned, um, blood pressure is an amazingly high cost driver in the system, hypertension and, and all the treatment cost as well as the other downstream cost of hypertension and what it can result in. 
So hypertension and its control has become really one of the basic metrics that almost all value-based reimbursement programs look at. And uh, the better you can manage blood pressure, the better you're going to perform, not only in terms of giving high quality care to your patients, but also in terms of being reimbursed under a, uh, a, 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 a value-based reimbursement model. So uh, delivering value at the point of care really boils down to, as Tom puts it, you know, taking a look at what we've all considered kind of, you know, a, a, a three-inch putt that uh, doesn't require a lot of skill and taking another look at uh, blood pressure measurement and saying, you know, well, what is the evidence base around that rather simple technique that we all learned back in medical school and what is the best practice approach to blood pressure medicine? And then uh, using that approach and applying that approach in your practice so that again, you can perform your, or improve your performance uh, with regard to blood pressure management and know that you're doing that in a data-driven fashion and that data is coming back to you as reliable data that you can use to change your practice patterns, uh, to change your performance and your processes of care, and most of all, to change and improve the outcomes that you get um, for blood pressure management at, uh, at the patient level. There's a lot of ways uh, to do this, uh, but again, there are some tools and uh, innovations that uh, now are available that certainly weren't available uh, when I was in training or even when I was in active practice. I would encourage you to look at these, uh, to consider uh, some of these tools and, and uh, innovations, which aren't, uh, you know, super uh, uh, fancy or uh, hard to implement or uh, really uh, high tech, but can make all the difference in terms of uh, getting you more reliable blood pressure measurements and a better idea of how you're managing your patient's blood pressure and its control so that, uh, again, in summary, you can take that, you can reliably deliver that data back to uh, those that uh, you're contracted with to do value-based care, and you can get adequately rewarded for paying attention to this very kind of uh, basic approach to care delivery and uh, delivering higher quality and lower cost to your patients, i.e. higher value. So just a, a, a quick summary then of uh, what I think, I, I hope I've uh, conveyed to you all that uh, uh, value-based care delivery is on the way. It's uh, something that we all need to pay attention to and blood pressure management and blood pressure measurement is uh, certainly uh, a, a mainstay of that. So Tom, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to uh, kind of close us out here. Appreciate that, Mac. It was a great, great summary. And uh, I think it highlighted again that uh, both we all know we're on that journey to value based care. And we give you a lot of arguments why this is important, both clinically and financially. And I think now we need to leave you with some very pragmatic sort of ideas as to what you can do maybe as early as tomorrow in your clinical practices across the country. Because uh, as, as Dr. Knight and I have emphasized, all this stuff is not rocket science. It's actually very, very simple, and the steps re resulting in improvements are rather dramatic. I, I anecdotally saw this firsthand. Did a lot of verification of uh, automated devices, and uh, was doing a lot of manual uh, kind of uh, gold standard comparisons uh, to see how well a device performed. And 
it was always astounding to me that uh, if you waited five minutes or you took a reading uh, after completely resting the patient and having them in the right position, uh, I could see this in real hand, real life, that, that even my somewhat uh, cynicism about it all became uh, anchored in, in belief when I saw this happen in front of my own eyes. So if you tomorrow I'll just instruct your patients coming in to avoid the coffee and the smoking, you know, 30 to 40 minutes before the visit, that will help. And the way you can argue with this is to say, hey, I don't want to put you on a medicine you don't need. And uh, you can go up as high as 10 or 15 points by simply you know, having the wrong choice of uh, what you have ingested uh, five minutes before arrival. So it's simple enough. Um, it's, it's, it's a quick, simple reminder of your patients when they schedule. Again, an automated device, uh, we're not here to say that the automated device is better than a carefully articulated manual reading, but we are saying that an automated device, uh, based on the scientific evidence, is the most reliable method for reducing whole system error around uh, blood pressure. Every patient gets the exact same reading, they get the exact same sort of technique for that reading, which allows you to trend more effectively, that it's not changing based on who took it, it's changing uh, based on the actual patient physiology. Third, uh, train your staff. Um, it's, it's this vitals acquisition tends to be a, a high pace kind of scenario. Uh, we tell people sometimes the best thing you can do is do the blood pressure at the end. If you're using an automated device, maybe you know, start the device and get out of the room and allow the device to kind of do its thing while you're, you're out of the room. So give your proper training to your staff and the next slide will give you just a quick tips on what that training would, would entail. It's widely available, and uh, we can certainly make that available to you from the, the speaker's desk here. And then finally, have the right equipment. Um, I'm always astounded when I do home projects on my own home improvement, and uh, I offer, ask someone to come in who's a professional. The first thing I notice is they have a tool that makes it incredibly easy, and uh, that's because they know that uh, the right equipment makes a difference. And then blood pressure attainment, if you can't properly position that arm and keep it supported, if you can't get the feet flat on the floor, it, it makes everything kind of difficult to try to uh, conjure up a method to do that without the right equipment. So in many cases, this is every patient, every time, half your patient population has this problem, or, and almost all of them will. This, this equipment matters. Your exam rooms are essential to your care management capabilities. And so this would be an area where I would encourage you, as Dr. Knight mentioned, to you know, dig under the tent a little bit and see what's out there. Um, on the proper technique for your staff, uh, this is what the SPRINT protocol uh, uh, affirmed. This is what the United States Prevention Task Force identified in their clinical study reviews. It's fairly simple stuff. Um, get your patients seated, wait at least a minute, ideally five minutes, get their feet flat on the floor, support their back, support their arm. Now, the reason for all that is that you're using musculature and you're kind of using your abdominal walls, using your, your, your back, your leg muscles. That all has a physiologic impact on how your heart re reacts to uh, sustaining blood pressure. So the more you can get the relaxed positioning, uh, the, the better the patient's true rested blood pressure is going to manifest. And, uh, and also, also, again, the automated systems allow you to average. If you can average and you have the, the availability to do that, it is remarkably impactful. Uh, the average rate reading drop from the first to the third on an averaging protocol is at least eight millimeters. So just uh, think, let that sink in a little bit that uh, you know, you're dropping almost 10 points just by awaiting the patient, letting the patient wait uh, from first to third. And then uh, also the transmission of that data to the electronic health record. The uh, U.S. Center Task Force has identified that people tend to write down the, the nearest tenth. So if it was a 132 blood pressure, uh, they would write down 130. So the uh, automatic transmission of data uh, doesn't do that. And the two points matters, if you will, in a blood pressure scenario. So. Hey, uh, we got about nine minutes to go. It's just been a complete pleasure uh, bringing this to you. We'll leave some time for a QA. and a um, And uh, hopefully this was valuable to you. And, uh, again, I think Dr. Knight and I would be most pleased to, you know, answer questions or provide you some further input on uh, ideas or concepts that you have in your head. So I'll pass it back to the moderator for, for that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tom. And Dr. Knight, uh, great presentations. Uh, we do have several questions coming in, and 
anyone who's wondering about that, please uh, put those questions in now while you've got the doctors here with us. So let's get to those questions while, while we have about eight more minutes. First one is, what do I do when a patient checks blood pressure at home, their pressure comes in at 160 over 90, and then it's 110 over 60 when I check it? So <laughs> How do, you, how do you clarify that? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm smiling. I wish you could see my picture with uh, acknowledgement of the problem. Uh, because I've, I've lived it, I'm sure Dr. Knight has brought up, let him answer too. But uh, actually, it's one of the things they found in the United States for the task force analysis is there is a sizable percentage of patient population out there that has the opposite of white coat. I forget the name of it, but they have a term where the patient's blood pressure actually normalizes in the presence of clinical environments and uh, is truly abnormal. Now, in those kind of patients, you really got to affirm the, the, the reading itself. Uh, first thing I would probably do is uh, have them bring their blood pressure cuff in and uh, see if you do a, a time, time comparison of the two to make sure you're getting a good reading. Second thing is uh, you can look at the American Heart Association approved at home devices. They have a list of the devices they feel are accurate. And I can tell you from my experience that the home devices do not follow the rigor of uh, accuracy determination that that a lot of that all of the uh, office stuff does. So be aware of that. And then the third option, which uh, I would you know consider, since this is such a dramatic shift, is maybe consider 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure, which is that device they put on their arm that does every 15 or 30-minute test to see if this is indeed true. Because I think as a clinician, you would know. If they're living at 160 over 90 something, as you described, uh, they're not in the low risk group by any stretch of the imagination. Mac, do you have anything to add to that? No, other than I would just agree with everything you said, Tom. Uh, I have had the unfortunate experience of being woken up in the middle of the night by uh, a patient who had uh, just checked his blood pressure four times with three different blood pressure monitoring devices and uh, I think there is a uh, vicious cycle sometimes that sets in with these folks and uh, they can uh, uh, they, they they can get a high reading and then get another high reading and then it just kind of triggers more and more anxiety so you just have to kind of I, I think uh, look at the individual patient and kind of think about what may be going on with them in terms of uh, is, is home blood pressure measurement uh, a good thing for everybody? Maybe not. Okay, those were great answers. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, got another interesting one here, and right before I read it, so we've got about five minutes left. If anybody else wants to drop a question in, please do so. So this question comes in from William, says, is it appropriate to compare the U.S. medical system to the government-controlled systems when addressing that cost equation, uh, some might agree that for specialty care, the U.S. health product is desired and delivers high-quality outcomes for destination or specialty care. Yeah, I think, uh, and I'll take this one real quick, if you don't mind. Um, I think that uh, William makes a great point. I think the U.S. health care system is commonly touted as the best healthcare system in the world. And I think one can make a, a great argument that in some respects it is. It is a destination for a lot of patients with uh, real complicated illnesses or conditions that need super, super high tech subspecialty type care. Is it the best in terms of producing uh, good population health across the board? Again, I think the, uh, the data there is not so strong. And uh, is it fair to compare us with other uh, countries that, uh, again, uh, uh, have different types of health insurance coverage? Well, one can argue, well, maybe that's why those other countries are getting better outcomes than we're getting in, in, in this country where uh, we don't have universal health care. So, again, a lot can be uh, debated there. I don't think we'll probably solve it today, but uh, I think William Bray, uh, brings uh, a, a good question out that uh, will be uh, a source of lots of debate going forward. 
Yeah, Dr. Knight, if we solve it today, then uh, we better alert the media because that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, oh, Tom. Tom and I have all the answers, but uh, we're just not going to throw them out today. So we want to save we're something. Smart enough not to run for political office. That's, that's <laughs> for right. sure. Uh, Dr. Tom, anything you wanted to add to that as well? No, no, I, I can't add to that. Thank you. Okay. We may have time for one more here. Rosemary has a really interesting uh, question. I, I can't wait to hear y'all's answer for this one. She's asking, is there any evidence that if you have a calm, serene waiting area with soothing music, um, can that affect blood pressure readings? Yes, I'll just say yes, outright, yes. Um, the thing that I think is uh, uh, becoming more and more apparent is the dynamic nature of blood pressure and the uh, direct impact that simple things have. I, I recall, Rosemary, a point when I was doing some blood pressure validation and I saw the, the, the subject in this case uh, picking up his iPhone and to take a look at his email and I saw his blood pressure in a matter of seconds go up at least five or eight points just from the act of his, uh, paying attention to his phone the stimulation. And the other thing I think we're seeing is uh, the clear impact of biofeedback and relaxation and the ability for the body to find a more serene type of uh, baseline. Um, yes, uh, this to me is, is a scenario that mirrors this uh, white coat hypertension, which is that high sterile doctor in a room and someone's going to touch me and intervene with me to your description of a relaxed music field, kind of relaxed, uh, comfortable position. Uh, yes. And I, I think the thing I would take away with that is the studies are really about that true rested BP. Yeah, we want to know the peaks. Those are very important. But it's really what do those arteries and heart experience all the time at, a, at, a, at the best case scenario? So, yes, I don't have data to, to give you that comparing a normal environment to a serene music field one. But my clinical suspicion is super high that that would be indeed a a, a place I'd like to be right now, but B, it's something that probably have a clinical impact. Mac, do you agree with that? No, I absolutely do. And I, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be a real serene, calm, music filled environment. I have found uh, even just simple things, many of which you mentioned, Tom, uh, can make all the difference in the world, such as uh, having the patient sit for a few minutes. Uh, before taking the blood pressure, such as having their feet flat on the floor, such as supporting their back and their arm. I mean, it's it's not uh, rocket science. It's not real fancy stuff, but uh, it sometimes amazes me that we've been doing blood pressure measurements for, uh, you know, probably over 100 years, and uh, <laughs> we don't uh, probably do it right uh, uh, almost half the, half the time or more, so... All right. Well, Dr. Knight and Dr. Tom, thank you for a great presentation. And again, thank you, uh, everyone who attended. Thanks to Rosemary and William and everyone else who was interacting and asking questions. Thank you so much. The education for this session is now ended. We'd like to thank Midmark for their sponsorship. Visit their website at midmark.com to learn more about how to design better care experiences harmonizing clinical space, workflow, and technology at the point of care. Now, if you do have any content questions, maybe you didn't think of it right now or you didn't get it answered, please email Dr. Schwederman at tschwederman at midmark.com. If you have a webinar question, contact us, contact ed at mgma.com. Now, as a reminder, both the live and on-demand experiences are eligible for ACMPE and CEU credit. For that live experience only, you can claim ACHE, CME, and PDU credit. If you do look for information on all of our conferences, please see the MGMA events page, mgma.com slash events. And if you haven't already, please click on that evaluation link located in the additional resources window. Thanks everyone for attending. Have a great day.